And I'd like to thank you not just for me, but for all the other Steve Davises out there. <laughs> we're not quite the Bill Smith Club, but we're close. I think there are five or six Steve Davises here in San Marcos, and gentlemen you see here. Um, people named Steve Davis have published thousands of books, so I tried to distinguish myself a bit by becoming Stephen L. Davis. And here's where that got me. Um, I went on to Amazon, like authors will do but not admit, see if my sales ranking had cracked the top 500,000 or not. And um, I saw there was a book by Stephen L. Davis called uh, Hunks, Hotties, and Pretty Boys. <laughs> 20th century representations of male beauty. And I'd like to send a little shout out to Mary Garcia on our staff who also noticed that and gleefully informed me of the fact. <laughs> but I'm getting used to stuff like this by now. Back in 2004, uh, when Texas Literary Outlaws came out, um, novelist Sarah Bird, somebody I considered a friend at the time, uh, was moderating the panel I was on at the Texas Book Festival. And she did a little Googling on Steve Davis to introduce me. And she didn't do nearly as well as Connie did. Here's what Sarah had to say. Steve Davis is, and you'll see some of these Steve Davises here. Steve Davis is an eclectic fellow, a world-class snooker player, who's also been voted one of Australia's funniest comedians, <laughs> and hailed as one of today's profound new voices on the trombone. Steve played quarterback for the Oklahoma Sooners in the 1970s. <laughs> reviewed porno films for the Austin Chronicle in the 1980s, and covers sports for the Dallas Morning News today. He is a Christian gay activist, a dentist, podiatrist, and periodontist. He's running for Congress in three states. And in addition to all this, Steve is currently serving several life sentences in prison <laughs> with no possibility for parole. So, so I think we have me out of the way, and we can talk about J. Frank Doby now. Oh. Well, this reminds me that I would like to acknowledge some of the wonderful people and this great dog who helped me with this book. We, do, we are fortunate to have Bill and Sally here today. Thank you for coming. And Bill Whitliff, is, as you may know, uh, really rescued Dobie's literary legacy uh, literally hours before it was to be dispersed to the four winds and used that uh, to found this collection here. And in addition, Bill gave me so much encouragement and support as I was writing this book, so thank you for that and also to Connie Todd and the wonderful people here at the Alkek Library and the Whitliff Collections. And there were so many fine folks and the dedication in the book probably went on too long. Um, but I would like to just say thank you in particular to Mark Busby and Joel Miner, Kathy Supple, Theresa May and the fine folks at UT Press. And also to Alan Darlene Lohman who donated a wonderful and comprehensive collection of Dobie's published materials to the university here, and that was a great help to me as I worked on this book. And also to Dudley Dobie and his wife, Seiza, who are here, who rescued the Dobie's house in Austin. And, and Dudley was kind enough to give me a guided tour of that home, which helped quite a bit. And my lovely wife, Georgia, who has uh, calculated that my publishing efforts are in our family about 11 cents an hour, <laughs> but is still so supportive of this particular mania that I have, so thank you. And then, of course, there's this guy here um, who I wanted to bring today, but we were afraid he would eat all the refreshments. So we left him at home. But those of you who have had a good dog or currently have a good dog, you know what they're like and how they support you so much and encourage you. And so I did sneak Truman's name into the acknowledgments. So sorry about that, UT Press. So J. Frank Doby. Um, somebody who thoroughly dominated Texas literature from the 1920s to the 1960s. In addition to his numerous books and magazine articles, he starred on radio programs. He had a syndicated column that appeared in newspapers around the state. His interpretations of Texas culture were sacrosanct, and he was a well-loved celebrity uh, called by many Mr. Texas. He's left behind quite a visible legacy, uh, schools across the state, uh, high school in Houston, elementary school in Dallas, uh, junior high outside of San Antonio, and a middle school in Austin. And also in Austin, we have the Dobie Mall, Dobie Theater, the Dobie Tower, which Dobie would have hated that skyscraper, of course. At Barton Springs, we have this wonderful statue, Philosopher's Rock. How many of you have seen this statue in person at Barton Springs? It's quite a cool deal. And there's Roy Betacek to his left and Walter Prescott Webb 
who you'll notice is wearing a suit because he was not a swimmer, but he is barefoot for the statue's sake. And then this is what would have happened to the Dobie home if Dudley and Seiza hadn't stepped in and, and saved that house. The Southland Corporation was ready to buy the property, tear down the house, and turn it into a 7-Eleven. But thank God that didn't happen, and so the Dobie house is preserved today. It's a National Historic Landmark, and it's home to the Michener Writer Center at UT Austin. And then we have the Dobie Paisano Fellowship, one of the country's most sought-after literary fellowships. Uh, this is on Dobie's 254-acre country place in the hills outside of Austin along Barton Springs. And this program has nurtured many of the state's greatest writers in their early years. And then here's the keystone in our logo, which also has a Adobe connection that we acquired through Bill and Sally. So 1964, April, Adobe was about 75 years old, and he was invited by Lyndon Johnson to visit the president at the White House. Uh, Adobe turned down the invitation, said his health was too poor. And so LBJ called him up. <laughs> he didn't record that conversation, but LBJ recorded a lot of his conversations. And in a subsequent call to the journalist Marshall McNeil, LBJ said, I called old man Doby this morning and told him I'd send Lady Bird's plane down there, bring him to Dallas, and I'd buy his tickets, and I'd get him up here, and he'd have to stay at the White House, and God damn it, he'd have to come up here and do it. And Johnson added, he said he didn't know whether he'd make it, but said, I'm like a horse that's down in his bottom. And LBJ, of course, was very persuasive. So there was Doby in the Oval Office. <laughs> and Tim, can you play that recording for us that we have? Hello? Or is this Harry Truman? Talking? Yes, sir, Mr. President. How are you, Lyndon Johnson? Well, my goodness alive. I'm mighty pleasure. glad to hear your, hear your well, voice. I, I thought I would report that I'd appeared and I thought maybe if, it's after, after, if it was convenient to you after lunch, I'd like to come over and pay a call to Well, you. I've got a good old friend of mine. Why don't you come and have lunch with me? Oh, my goodness alive. Come over, I, here, I, come I, over here about 1.30 and uh, uh, you can walk over here. And oh, I, yes. I'll, I'll I'm going to I'm gonna have a little press conference in the next, uh, oh, I guess it's about 12 o'clock. I'm just going to let them yeah. come in and tell them I go for the weekend. But if you want to come over... Say 12:45, one o'clock, while we'll uh, say howdy to the boys, and then you and I and Dr. Frank Doby, an old friend of mine uh, that you've met down in Texas two or three times with Rayburn, uh, uh, he's here, and we just have a quiet little luncheon, well, and uh, you you come and eat with us, and uh, just I'll give you well. I'll give you I'll give you a snort or two, but I won't <laughs> put you on a helicopter. <laughs> I won't put you on a helicopter. Oh, all right. I told I'll obey the presence. You know, I always do that. All right. <laughs> Especially when it's you. Thank you, Mr. President. Now I'll be over. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. Yeah, aren't you glad you got to hear that? <laughs> you know, gives you a good idea of what LBJ was like. Just a few months after this photo was taken, Doby had died, and... As a measure of his stature, at the time his death was front page newspapers across the state. And you'll notice also here this uh, reference to the Vietnam War. And that really has a lot to do with the kind of rapid decline in Dobie's literary reputation. There was this great generational conflict that erupted during the 60s. And there was a lot of rancor that emerged towards Dobie at that time, some of which is still felt today. Um, here's some of the the three leading critics of Doby that you'll see through the years. Does anybody know who the person on the left is? Yes. It's Larry McMurtry, wearing his famous shirt, Minor Regional Novelist. Uh, very ironic and um, kind of making fun of his status as a Texas writer. And uh, just a totally different attitude, I think, than Doby had, who uh, sort of filled the Southwest. And um, as Mark Busby has noted, and some other scholars have, McMurtry is really trying to find some psychic space for his own work by clearing out the people ahead of him. And so he uh, had some pretty harsh words about uh, Adobe in an effort to do that. And then in the middle, do you know who that is? Catherine Ann Porter. Uh -huh. And um, she's somebody who you know, has a worldwide reputation and uh, is still very popular, uh, very much studied. And she lost uh, an important uh, book award to J. Frank Doby at the Texas Institute of Letters in 1939 that people still talk about and have not forgiven Doby for. And uh, a lot of uh, you know, 
Dobie died in 1964. I think the Feminine Mystique was published in 1963 and the feminism movement came about. And uh, there's still many women scholars who uh, sort of dump on Dobie as kind of emblematic of the white, white male rule. And, um, and that's kind of interesting because Dobie actually sponsored several women writers and did everything he could to help them. And part of that's in the book. This guy on the right, do you know who that is? Mm -hmm. Americo Paredes, the godfather of Chicano literature, who uh, really issued kind of the most scathing literary portrait that you'll see of Dobie in print. And I think Paredes uh, felt bad about that later. He wrote this book, uh, George Washington Gomez, when he was an angry young man. And Dobie was kind of at the height of his jingoistic view of Texas. And later they got to know each other and actually uh, became very friendly with each other. And Paredes sang a corrido in Dobie's honor after he died. And late in his life, Paredes referred to Dobie as a lovable old fraud. <laughs> so with all of that criticism, we had kind of a new image of Dobie develop over the last couple of generations. Uh, somebody who was arrogant, uh, an arrogant symbol of white male rule, basically, and somebody who is increasingly irrelevant to our modern age. And you can see that expression on Dobie's face there, give you a better look. <laughs> That's uh, an expression that his wife Bertha probably saw more than she wanted to. Um, and so there, you know, like everything, there's, there's some truth in that. But really, Dobie is a much more complex person than kind of the, the vision that we've developed of him over the last 40 years or so since his death. This is Lon Tingle's biography, which was published in 1978, the last major study of Dobie. And what I wanted to do was to go back beyond what Tinkle had done and kind of do a major reassessment of Dobie and to find out who he really was. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you have your kids help you with the PowerPoint. And um, they've had so much fun with that Robert Plant wig. So, do you remember, Georgia, when I may have been a little bit hungover one Sunday morning and woke up with the wig on and stuff? There's just. So, oh well. There we go. So the view we've had of Dobie for so many years is this uh, kind of a old Robert Frost looking guy. And what I wanted to do was to show him as a young man in color and found this beautiful painting that Alexander Hoag had done of Dobie, kind of at the prime of his life. And so it was so cool that we could use that for the cover. And one question you ask in reconstructing Dobie's life is, how did he become such a dominant force, such a dominant figure? And a big part of it really was because he was the guy who rescued all of our oral folklore that we had. Uh, Dobie came of age at a time when the open range was being closed off, the railroads were coming, America was rapidly industrializing. And all of this oral culture, these folk tales that people told to each other, were all kind of disappearing in this onslaught, this rush towards modernism. And so he went out into the back country and talked to the old timers and collected their stories and, and really saved a lot of these tales. And uh, was just a, a great hero to many people for that reason. Some of the stories, many of the stories actually were about buried treasure. And in 1930, uh, when the depression was just taking hold, W published Coronado's Children and that book became a huge success. A lot of people uh, like to use it to try to, to find the buried treasure themselves. Um, but the, the thing that happened uh, with this book um, is that the New York Literary Guild adopted it as their chosen title. And that was really the first time anybody from interior America had been so honored. And so the book became a bestseller and, and it just sort of catapulted Dobie to the, the top of culture in Texas. Uh, he had that New York validation and he was writing authentically about the land here. and so. People just went nuts. And uh, just that one book made him kind of an instant legend. And people loved him for that uh, ever after. And there, uh, one of the things you see in the archives here, and also that we got from Al Lohman too, uh, back in those days, people didn't have blogs. So uh, somebody who had an opinion on a matter would, would privately print a little pamphlet. Uh, you see some, an open question for Mr. J. Frank Doby, or critical of his politics, or. Uh, many more where people were kind of writing these beautiful testaments to what they saw in Dobie. And here's one from 1932. I'm just going to quote a bit of it just to give you an idea of how people thought about Dobie at the time. This man, J. Forrest McCutcheon, printed a pamphlet called J. Frank Dobie, Texan, an Appreciation. And he described Dobie this way.